What is love? Welcome to LifeGate. If this might be one of your first times, we are so glad you're here. Um, thank you for coming and spending Sunday with us. Of all the things that you could have done, you've opted to come and be with us, and it's been wonderful joining our voices together and lift a praise and a, and a love to the Lord. Thank you for coming and being with, it, with us. If I haven't met you, I would love to meet you. Um, if you're not in a real hurry after the service is over, hang around. I'd love to shake your hand and, and meet you and, and, uh, and just get to know you a little better. We know you've got loved ones that you want to see coming to the kingdom of God, and that's what LifeGate Church is all about. It's reaching people and making them devoted followers of Jesus Christ. So we want you to be with us and help us reach this region in a way never before reached. Well, thank you for being with us. If you've got your Bibles, and I hope that you do, I'd like for you to turn with me to some scriptures. Uh, how about uh, Song of Solomon? That's a good one about love, right? The book, uh, chapter 8, verse 6 and 7. We'll be spending a lot of time there. Also, the book of Judges, we're talking about Samson a little bit today. Uh, I need you, though, in chapter 16. Uh, chapter 15 also talks about him, but I need you in chapter 16 and verse 4. And then, if you want to keep on hanging with me, Genesis chapter 21 and verse 1. There, Abraham and Sarah will talk about their love. But we're going to be talking about love, and we're in a, in a series. So let me pray, and then we'll get started. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for this wonderful time that we've had together in this wonderful day. Thank you for people, Lord, that want to come together and uh, worship together and praise together, and love together. So Father, I thank you for this time. I pray, the Lord, for myself that I'll not talk too fast or too slow, and the things that I will be saying will be interesting, and that everyone will gain something, and when we leave here today, that we'll know more about love, and we'll have something that will be applicable to our lives, that we can truly put into our life to make life good, because it's good to be alive. We ask you to bless our time together in Jesus' name. We pray. And everybody says something. Say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Something. Yes. Hallelujah. Well, we're in our series, and in the series, of course, is called It's Good to Be Alive. God has given us a lot of things to make life good, and that's what we've tried to uh, be depict on, on our boxes of candy here. Uh, for example, God's given us his favor. The favor of God is like a, a royal straight flush. If you know anything about card games or poker specifically, you cannot lose with a royal straight flush. And the favor of God is God doing favors for us. It's wonderful to go through life. You can't be beaten when God's doing favors for you. He's also given us family. Family can make life really good or make life really bad. You know, it's according to how, how it works in your life. But if you do family the way God says family, then it's there to make life good. And it's good to be alive and have family. And Jesus went on a little further and he says, who is my family? Who is my mother and my sisters and my brothers? He says, these that do the will of God. So you see, we can, we can bring that into a place in our life where family becomes our spiritual consultants and our spiritual things that raise us to the abundant life that Jesus came to give us. He's also given us friends. Friends stick with you closer than a brother. Jesus was on the cross dying and, and he looks down at a friend, not a literal brother, but not a physical brother, but at a friend and he says, behold your mother. See, friends will take care of things when you're not able to. Friends will be there in thick and thin. Friends will be there to make life good for you. While you're in your cross experiences, your friends will be there. Last week we talked about conflict. Remember that one? Boxing ring and all that good stuff. God's given us conflict, but conflict is to make life good. They're stepping stones. Conflicts are stepping stones that take us higher and higher and higher. You stop acquiring and achieving in life when you stop passing the test or the conflicts. So God's given us conflicts to make life good. And so this week, we're going to be talking about another thing that God's given us to make life really, really good, and it's love. And so today, we're going to call it, It's Good to Be Alive and Have Love and Have Love. We planned this in our, in our session, in our, in our planning session as we were, were developing this series, and we knew that our time would run right through the Valentine uh, holiday, or Valentine time, and, uh, and so what we wanted to do was do this particular week on love, and so it had a great influence on, on, on what we put together to bring to you, but today we knew that we would be talking about love. So I'm going to ask you just what these People were asked in this video, what is love? Now, I'm going to answer that for you in just a little while, and I hope I give you an answer that you'll never forget. But before I answer that question for you, I want to ask you another question, all right? How many of you right this very minute are in love? How many of you right now love someone, and you think that you really love them? How many of you right now, I want to show you, showing of your hand, would you raise your hand if you are in love? Look at that, look at that, Wow. 
That's just about everybody. Now, some of you young people didn't raise your hands. Now, now I want you to know your parents understand. Because they did too, you see. They loved too. Uh, love is a fact of life. It's an inevitable fact of life. You cannot go through life without loving. One day, your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren will love just like you have loved. One day, one day, everything that you've ever acquired and done in life will be somehow related to the person or persons that you loved. God has wired you to love. He's wired you to love because it requires love to ascend to the place in life where you have the abundance that he came to give you. Without love, you never experience the joy or the fulfillment or the abundance that God come, came to give you. Love is necessary. God's wired you to love. You are supposed to love. So, let's talk about that, okay? Love is a tremendous, huge doctrine in the Bible. It is huge. There's so many scriptures about love in the Bible. In the Old Testament, which is the Hebrew, there are eight different words that are described for love, that are used for love. And right now, they're supposed to be coming up on the screen for you. That's in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, there are, there are three words that are basically used, but these three words are really 11 different Hebrew words that come to us. But the three base words are agape, filio, and thelo. Now, you have all of these words for love, and, and how in the world, you know, you, and you can, we can go through the Greek and the Hebrew and try to define them and figure out what love is. But here's the way I like to do it. It's just simply say that love changes. Love changes. Love constantly is changing in your life. So, let me kind of show you what I mean. And Judy's going to help me with this illustration. So, come here, Judy, and give me some love. <laughs> now, what, what love is, is, is that you take love, your heart. A little magic trick there. And... and you take your heart and you then begin to give your heart layer by layer to another person. And you hope that this person gives you love back. <laughs> give me some more love. I think my love's bigger than your love. No way. And as you as you give that person your love or your heart, I give you too much love? Oh, you didn't take your love. Okay. As you give that person your love or your heart, what you're doing is that you're giving them your emotions and your will and your vision for life. And the more you give them, the more power you're giving them to control your heart or your life. In other words, this person now can make me happy or sad. They hold my heart. They hold my emotions. This person now can cause me to do good things or bad things. And I'm telling you, buddy, because they control my will. And when we were dating... She made me do some bad things. <laughs> and we, <laughs> this person also holds your heart or holds your vision for life. She now can help me fulfill my vision or stop me from fulfilling my vision because she now holds my heart. She has power to direct my life. That's what we do as we fall in love. As love changes, you see, we keep giving the person more and more heart or more and more power. 
So when you love someone, you're allowing them to have power in your life. You get that? You don't, all, you don't do it all at once. You, you never give someone, but you'll little by little and layer by layer until you've given them enough power to control you, whether you go up or whether you go down. And life is all about love. Paul says, there's faith, hope, and love, and the greatest is, is love. Everything that you do is about love. It will take you up, it'll take you down. Is that a pretty good illustration? Thank you. Now, love controls your destiny. It's powerful. It is the greatest force in life. They asked Jesus one day, Lord, what is the greatest commandment? What is the most powerful force in life? And here's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. In other words, this is the greatest force in life. If you want a successful life, then it's about love. The reason that he says you need to love God is because what God will always do with his love is bring you up. God will never break your heart. Right? Although he, he has this, this potential, he, he wants you to have a happy life and a joyful life. So as we love God, he's always pulling us upward. He won't break our heart. He won't make you do anything you won't want, don't want to do. He won't control your will even though he could. Even though you give him all of your heart, he still won't make you do bad things or make you even do good things. <laughs> and he won't control your vision. He wants you to fulfill your dream. He will help you. You see, as we begin to love God and love people, then we should ascend in life and go to the place that God has for us. Love is powerful. And giving it to someone else to control will control your life. Love is powerful. It controls your heart, therefore it controls your life. Here's what the Song of Solomon says in chapter 8 and verse 6, and I hope you're there in your Bible. Please take some notes. This is going to be so good, so profound, I think, that will help every single person, especially you young folk. Please hear this today. Song of Solomon in chapter 8 and verse 6 says this, Place me like a seal. Like a what? Seal. A signet seal. It's a seal over, my, over your heart. Place me over your heart. Like a seal. Leave that up there. Let me just talk a second. Place me like a seal over your heart. In other words, let me have control of your heart. Let me control what goes in your heart. Let me control what comes out of your heart. Like, like you seal an arm. Let me seal up your arm so that it's limited, that it's controlled as to how much it can move and how much you can do with it. Let me seal your heart in that way. And it's jealousy... And its jealousy is as enduring as the grave. Love flashes like what? What does love flash like? Fire. The brightest kind of flame. Love in your emotional realm is like fire in the natural realm. It will consume you. The Bible always talks about God. God is love, but also God is what? A consuming fire. What fire does is consume, and what love will do in your heart is consume. It's bright, but it can consume like a, the hottest kind of flame. Verse 7 says, Many waters cannot quench love. You can't put it out. Neither can rivers drown it. If a man tried to buy love with everything he owned, his offer would be utterly despised. I'm going to talk about that verse for a little while and get some handles on love. But right now, let's answer that question, what is love? Here is the definition that I want us to see today. Love is an amazing power that you willingly give the person that you want to love you. And with that power, that person can take you up to the abundant life or can take you down to destruction. Let me read that one more time. Love is an amazing power 
that you willingly give to the person that you want to love you. And with that power, that person can take you to the abundant life or can take you down to destruction. Now, how did that song go by Huey Lewis, <laughs> Lewis and, and the news? What did, it, what did it say about the power of love? How did that song go? <laughs> love is a power that someone holds over your life. Love will make you sing or make you cry. It controls your destiny. That's the power of love. Uh, Song of Solomon, chapter uh, 8 and verse 6 says this, Place me like a seal over your heart or like a seal on your arm, for love is as what? As strong as death. It's powerful. Let's see now, how did that song go by George Jones? Um, <laughs> he stopped loving her today. <laughs> Love is as strong as death, the Bible says. What does that mean? Once love grips you, it can pull you down, or it can grip you and pull you up. Once love gets its hold on you, it's very difficult to get it to let you go. It won't let you go. It will be your joy and your laughter or your deepest depression. Love will take you up or take you down. Make you jealous, make you sad. It'll gnaw at you. It can make you miserable and it can even kill you. It's as strong as death. In the right hands, it will make you great. In the wrong hands, it will destroy your life. That's the power that love holds. Song of Solomon 8, 6 says this, For love is as strong as death and it's jealousy. Whose jealousy? Okay, get, it, get this. This is important. Love is as strong as death and it's jealousy. Whose jealousy? What's jealousy? Love's jealousy. See, when you love, it brings jealousy. It's a part of it. It's how it's made. It's how it's created. It's jealousy is as enduring as the grave. Huh. Love brings jealousy with it. Um, what jealousy does is eat at your heart. And again, your heart is your will. Love can make you do wrong things or right things. Your heart is also your emotions. It'll make you happy or sad. Love is also your vision for life. It will fulfill your vision or destroy your vision. And if jealousy is in there, it can just bring you down, control your mind, your intellect, how you think, cause you to do crazy things. Love is powerful. And that's the power that it holds. Song of Solomon, verse, chapter 8, verse 7 says, Many waters cannot quench love, neither can rivers drown it. If a man tried to what? Buy love, with everything he owned, his offer would be utterly despised. In other words, you can't buy love, right? What was that song now the Beatles had? <laughs> can't buy me love, is that what? <laughs> love fulfills life. Love is a mighty power, but it cannot be bought. The reason that it can't be bought is because we willingly are the only ones, we are the only ones who can willingly give it to someone else. Money can enhance it and make it fun, <laughs> but money can't buy it. And the reason that it can't buy it is because you control who does it to you. 
You can have everything in life. You can be a Donald Trump. Planes, buildings, casinos, have it all. But if you don't have that right person there to spend it with you, you constantly are searching for that person that can experience love. And you'll do it again and try it again and try it again. See, money can't buy love. Loving the correct person and allowing the correct person to love you will raise you, your life and make life good in every area or loving the wrong person and allowing the wrong person to love you can mess your life up in every area. You can experience destruction by giving your love to the wrong one. Now, the Bible gives us the account of Samson. Um, the Lord God had big plans for Samson. In fact, he sent an angel to the parents of Samson to, uh, to tell, tell them what he had planned for Samson. Uh, but Samson had this knack of giving his love to the wrong women. <laughs> and though God had great plans for him, wanted him to experience the abundant life, Samson's life ended in suicide because he found love in all the wrong places. <laughs> I had to know, I had to know, didn't I? <laughs> Did you know that uh, everything in the Bible that is written about Samson is related to his searching for love? and searching for satisfaction. Every single thing. When he ripped the lion apart by his bare hands, he was looking for love. When, when, he, uh, when he made that riddle about the honey and the carcass of the lion, he was looking for love. When, uh, let's see, when he killed the 1,000 Philistines with, with the jawbone of a donkey, he was, it was about love. When he took the foxes and burned up all the, the fields of wheat, he was looking for love. When he carried the gates away of, of the city, he was looking for love. When he had his head shaved and his eyes gouged out and he pulled that building down on him, his, himself, he was looking for love. You know, what's amazing here is uh, our epitaph one day will all be about all, will be all about whom we love. Everything that was written about Samson was about who he loved. And one day, whatever you do, up or down, is going to be related to the person to whom you loved, to whom you allowed to have that control over your life. What will your appetite have to say? I guarantee you it'll be related to love. <laughs> Samson never learned the amazing power that love had over him. Uh, I wonder if we ever will. Uh, loving the wrong person was his demise. And uh, as a young man, let me tell you just a little bit about his life. As a young man, Samson fell in love with a Philistine woman. Now, this woman was greatly... Uh, what's the word? I don't want to say this. Uh, Samson's parents were greatly against Samson marrying this woman. I mean, very against. But Samson said, get her for me. He would have it no other way. Wouldn't listen to his parents. See, when we love, we need to listen to counsel. We get so blinded by it. It's a fire. Anyway, he married her. And you know what happened? Well, he, it was crazy, but anyway... What ended up happening here is she betrayed him just as her parents had warned. And she gave information, private information, secret information to some people who used it against Samson. And because that Samson was, Samson's, the information was given to people, Samson now got in great debt. He owed all this money. And to pay the debt, what Samson had to do was murder and steal. 
Samson became somebody that he never thought he would be and did things that he never thought he would have to do. Why? Because he gave his love to the wrong person. I know so many people today who have become something that they never thought they would have become because they trustingly gave their love to the wrong person. And I know so many people today who are still paying off the debt. Mentally, physically, emotionally, financially. That loving the wrong person indebted them. And you know them too. In fact, you might be one. See, love is powerful. And if you don't understand its power, you'll do like Samson. And it'll grip you and it'll pull you down. Samson never learned the power that love had on him. Will we? Judges chapter 16 and verse 4 says this. Sometime later he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. Let's see now, what was that song that the Pointer Sisters sang? Fire. <laughs> Talking about a fatal attraction. <laughs> that was one, Samson and Delilah. Wow. <laughs> Sometime love is fatal. It has that power. Delilah was bribed by Samson's enemies to find out from where he received his strength. <laughs> this was amazing. You see, though Samson was a mighty man physically, a man of God with tremendous ability, he was no match for the power of love. And neither are you and neither am I. And without understanding the power of love, our lives could end up exactly like Samson's. It's all according unto whom you give the power. Delilah bribed him. And it was like fire. But you know, you don't play with fire, right? Because fire is a ring. Johnny Cash <laughs> sang a song. You just never know here, do you? We do it on purpose, you realize that. You'll come back next week to see what are they going to do next time. Delilah asked Samson what made him strong. And initially, he had just peeled off a little heart giving her a little power. So he was able to resist the temptation of really telling her the truth, so he started making up things. <laughs> and he says, if you bind me with seven bowstrings that are still wet, I'll be as weak as any other man. <laughs> well, guess what Delilah did? She bound him up with seven bowstrings, and then she called the Philistines, and the Philistines came running in, and Samson jumped up and broke them, and escaped. And you would think, wouldn't you? I need to stay away from this chick. This chick is bad news. But did he? That's oh, the power of love. It grips you. So he peeled off a little more heart. The Bible tells us four times that this happened. And every time he would give her some answer or some excuse for the love, you know, what made him strong, give her a little more power, a little more power. And finally, though, the Bible just says that he just got so tired of trying to trick her, he just told her the truth. And she had that power on him. Finally, he had peeled off enough that she controlled him. And she had power on him. Power over his life. Judges 16, 17 says, Finally, Samson told her his secret. My hair has never been cut 
he confessed. For as I, dedicate, as I was dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth, my head, if my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as anyone else. So what did Delilah do? Shaved his head. Handing the power of love to the wrong person will remove your power and will attack the thing from which you get it. If you love God and you're getting your strength from God and you've married the wrong person, now some of you have experienced this, that person will start gnawing and pulling and drawing on your relationship with God. And the next thing is you're captured. Because love has that power. And you'll find yourself not being able to, be sh to shake yourself loose like you have before. You're not being able to resist that backseat as you resisted before. Or not being able to resist that lying as you did before. Or not be able to resist that stealing as you did before. All of a sudden your power is gone. Judges 16, 20 says, Then she cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. When he broke up, he woke up, he thought, I will do as before and shake myself free. But this time Samson couldn't shake. Too many peels, too, many, too much of the heart had been peeled off. Too many layers had been given to Delilah. And he was captured, not by Delilah, but by love. Judges 16, 21 says, So the Philistines captured him and gouged out his eyes. They took him to Gaza, where he was bound with bronze chains. They didn't just capture him and just gouge out his eyes. Leave that up there, please. They captured him. A lot of people get captured, but they can get free. They also gouged out his eyes. They took away his vision for life. See, that's what love will do. It removes your vision, gouges out your eyes, your vision for life. But they also put him in not just regular chains, but bronze chains. Special bondage. Special capture. See, love isn't like anything else. It's a special emotion. And when love gets you, it holds you. It's as strong as death. It's a special capture. It's unlike any other emotion. It's unlike any other force because it is so powerful. And it's the power that we willingly give to another person. It says that they gouged out his eyes. They took him to Gaza where they bound him with bronze chains and made him grind grain in the prison. He no longer ground grain for the people of God. He ground grain for the enemy. See, when this gets you and it goes the wrong way, you stop serving God you lose your power, all of a sudden you're working for the enemy, you're working for darkness, and you've stopped delivering the people of God and feeding them. It's the power of love, of which we willingly give to someone to use on us. What is love? Love is giving a person the power to control you. Well, Samson died a horrible death. He never got his vision back. He did sense the presence of God again as his hair grew out, which is how he related to God. But it never was the same. And so they took Samson, and they were going to parade him, and they took him into this building with these pillars, and you know how the story goes, and tied him up to one of these, to the pillars, and Samson committed suicide. Oh, yeah, he killed some Philistines doing it. But he committed suicide. He said, Lord, let me die. And he committed suicide because of love. He had given his love, the power of love, to the wrong person. Do you know that most suicides are love-related? And if you've ever had your heart broken enough and hard enough and bad enough, it crossed your mind. It crossed through your head. You see, because love makes life mean something. It's a power, and it's strong. 
And love is as strong as death. Ask Samson. We, uh, we discussed this message, this lesson, in our planning session. And, uh, and we, were, we, were, we, were, we, we could find all of these illustrations where love went awry, you know, where the wrong person had been given the power of love and misused it on someone else, on the person that had given it. Uh, and I was sitting back there, you know, and we were, and we were, we were discussing it, and uh, I, in my mind, I couldn't come up with a perfect love story in the Bible. And so I asked the group, I said, uh, is there a perfect love story in the Bible? And all of these minds went to work and started churning, and, and all of them know the Bible pretty well, and no one could come up with a perfect love story. <laughs> ah, we can find the other. You know, we can find the negative where love was misused. We can find, we can find a love story where, uh, like, for example, Adam and Eve. Eve misused the power of love. Uh, we could, uh, Rebecca and Isaac. Or Rachel and Isaac. Whichever. <laughs> David and Michael. Michael and Bathsheba. Oh, excuse me. David and Bathsheba. <laughs> David and Bathsheba. But we couldn't come up with one that was perfect, where nothing weird happened, where no glitches took place, where no strange things happened. We just couldn't find one. So what does that tell us? If I can't find a perfect love story in the Bible, what does that tell me? You probably ain't going to have a perfect love story. And the fallacy that you're going to live happily ever after? In fact, what love really is, is working through the glitches and working through the problems and working through those crazy things. You see, there's a story, though, that did that. There's this couple that the Bible tells us about. And their name was Abraham and Sarah. And it's an amazing story about people giving the power of love to the correct person. It's a story about two people who fell in love and went through life together. Loving each other. Layering after layer after layer. Exchanging their love through life. But not without glitches. And not without some weird stuff happening. Twice, Abraham, <laughs> twice Abraham used the power of love that he had over his wife Sarah to convince her, because he was frightful for his own life, to convince his wife Sarah to join up with harems. Twice he did this. Not once, twice. Once with Pharaoh and once with Abimelech. I could just see me doing that to Judy and trying to work through that. <laughs> right? <laughs> but they were able to. God steps in. You see, God stepped in and, and, and protected Sarah. Abimelech nor Pharaoh ever touched her. In fact, God told him, if you touch her, you're a dead man. God steps in when you do love right and makes it work out. And once Sarah used her power of love over Abram because she wanted a child so desperately, so badly that she wanted to raise a child that she convinced him to have a child with another woman. A little servant girl. And he did it. I can see Judy. <laughs> that ain't going to happen, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> but my point is, is they worked through it. God stepped in again. That was a horrible thing. Of all the, all the uh, things that happened there with, with Hagar and, and all the things that were going on there with Ishmael, it lasted for years. Their whole household was, was in disarray and dysfunctional. God didn't even speak to Abraham in all of that time. <laughs> but God steps in and they work through it. You see, that's the power of love. 
Because it finally, as you allow it with the correct vision, with, as two hearts come together, exchanging through life, working through glitches and problems and situations, and yet moving on to the call of God on an individual's life, doing love God's way, God steps in and moves, and finally you come to the place that it is impossible to fulfill your dream, and then all of a sudden your dream is fulfilled. The impossible happens. See, some of us feel like we'll never experience our dream. We'll never experience it because it's so impossible. Listen, let me tell you, with man it might be, but with God, all things are possible. And that's where that scripture comes from. God came, God came to Abraham and Sarah, and he told them, this time next year, Sarah is going to have a baby, and they laughed. And God says, is anything too difficult for God? You see, when you love correctly and you allow love to grip you and continually move you up toward the vision that God's given to you, the impossible dream takes place. But it's all about to whom you give the power of love. It will take you up or it will bring you down. You know, their love may not have been perfect, but their love was endless. What was that song? Lionel Richie and... And it's like that, dreams are fulfilled. Love brings you to the fulfillment of dreams. Love eventually brought them both to finding their dream, both Abraham and Sarah. Amazing. See, Abraham's dream was to have a son, an heir, by Sarah. He didn't want one with Hagar. He wanted it from Sarah, but now Sarah's 90 years old. Sarah's dream was to give Abraham a son, but a son that she birthed, a son that she could nurse, a son that she could raise. Impossible, though. Or was it? Not when you do love right. When you do love right, it works. And here's what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 21, verse 1. Then the Lord did exactly what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant, and she gave a son to Abraham in his old age. And it all happened at the time God had said it would. And Abraham named his son Isaac. Eight days after Isaac was born, Abraham circumcised him as, as God had commanded. Abraham was 100 years old at the, at the time, and Sarah declared... God has brought me laughter. All who hear about this will laugh with me. For who would have dreamed? See, love the right people makes your dreams come true. For who would have dreamed that I would ever have a baby? Yet I have given Abraham a son in, in his old age. As time went by, and Isaac grew and was weaned, Abraham gave a big party to celebrate the happy occasion. See, love done right makes everything work right. Oh yeah, there's glitches and there's going to be problems. But when you love God's way and you're chasing your dreams and fulfilling your vision, it's going to work. And love takes you to the dream place. Love is a power designed by God to take us up and to make dreams come true. Now, I just did this, this part here. This is not in my notes, so you guys don't go crazy back there. But I just, I just felt like I needed to give you about four or five points as to how to find the right love. Rather than, rather than just ending it the way I was going to do and tell you that, that life is meaningless, that's what Paul says, I can be a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal if I don't have love, right? So life is meaningless without love, but rather than telling you that, I just want to give you four things, and I really wish you'd write these down. Four principles to find the correct person to give yourself, to give your heart to. Just, I'm going to do them real quickly. Number one, make certain that the person you love loves God. Let me say that one more time. Make certain that the person you love loves God. You cannot go down if you both love God because God's going to pull you up, right? You can't go down. You can't mess up if both of you love God. Number two, make certain 
that your vision for life is compatible with their vision for life. Say it again. Make certain that your vision for life is compatible with their vision for life. Don't, because he or she is good looking. That's Samson and Delilah. That's suicide. You find out where vision is. You find out where this person's going with their life, what they want out of life. Where are you going with life? Will these roads meet and work together to get there? Or are you both going separate ways? Number three, listen to counsel. People who love you, listen to those people. Listen to your parents, young people. Don't be like Samson. I have yet to find in the natural. Now, you can watch movies about this, but I have yet to really see one work out in the natural where parents displeased of a, of a union between a, a, a boy and a girl or a man and a woman where it really worked out. It happens in the movies all the time. But you're not living a movie. You're in the real world. Make sure you get counsel. People that love you, if you're young enough and you still have your parents, ask your parents. Never make a decision as large and powerful as love without getting counsel. You find yourself falling for somebody, peeling your heart off to them, you better start talking to somebody. Somebody that loves you and somebody that can see a little further than you can. Number four, realize there is no perfect love. Realize there is no perfect love. All loves have glitches and problems, but if you do love God's way, God will step in and take you up. Let me read that one more time. Realize there is no perfect love. All loves have glitches and problems, but if you do love God's way, God will step in and take you on and up. Love is the most powerful force that you'll ever have. You go to that last scripture for me, please, in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Love is the greatest, the brightest, the strongest emotion. It's the strongest force that you will ever face. Love has the power to take a person to the highest summit of joy and glee in life, or to the deepest depths of depravity and suicide. Love is powerful. Love is your giving the power to control your life to another person. And if you'll remember that, you won't end up like Samson. And you'll make wise choices and you'll see your dreams come true. How many want some good loving? Do you? Give the Lord a shout and a hand clap. Amen. Amen.